Alrighty, so we're nearly there. The last four sessions of the festival. Boo. Uh, this one is number 17 of the Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. Uh, and this one is all around transmedia digital storytelling, uh, which is the one I've been looking forward to the most. Um, so I'm really excited to welcome Simon and Myra again from Bright Black and Damien from the University of Johannesburg. Um, so we're going to have two speaker sessions today um, where we hear about their ideas around transmedia digital storytelling and then a bit of Q&A at the end. Um, it may finish slightly earlier today just because we have um, the two sessions rather than three, um, which is fine. Uh, unless, of course, Robbie and Olivia come through with millions of questions, <laughs> which wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> They've been really great. Uh, so, um, yeah, so just a couple of little housekeeping things. So the sessions are recorded and put on northerndigifest.co.uk uh, website afterwards. So if you missed the session or you want to share it with your friends, uh, please have a look there and you can catch up with it afterwards. Um, and all of the other sessions are up there as well for your viewing pleasure. Um, there's, as I say, this session and three more left. Um, so if you want to book tickets for them, it's all free, it's all online, and you can do that on the website as well. Um, so it's all there. A little uh, shout out to Sign, the Screen Industries Growth Network, and a big thank you to them for helping to support the festival, uh, without whom we couldn't run it. So big thank you to you guys. Uh, and let's get started. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce Damien first. Um, D Dr. Damien Tomaselli is an award-winning filmmaker and creator of Astrolabe Studios and a postdoctoral fellow at the Visual Identities in Art and Design at the University of Johannesburg. He is a transmedia storyteller with a background that includes theatre, film and photo manipulation. Currently is focused on the emerging media of virtual reality, mixed reality and motion book technology. His recent projects include the launch of an augmented reality comic book at Comic Con Africa. Damien's talk will focus on the concept of adaptation and at which point adaptation can and should be substituted with full scale re-engineering. To demonstrate, he will use motion comics adapted from traditional comics and 3D films adapted from 2D films to discuss notions of native storytelling. Over to you, Damien. Thanks, Heather. It's always interesting when you read back the descriptions that I gave you because I sent them to you a couple of weeks ago and in working on the slides, I often they take their own form and then um, <laughs> kind of forget what I said. Uh, so that's a good reminder. Um, OK, so I'm going to ask you to share the slides for me because you know the story with my computer and um, to get into it. So my, my first point is that transmedia, if we can go to slide one. Um, I'm going to be quite bold and bullish and take the position that there's almost no such thing as transmedia. It's almost a lazy term in a way, and it doesn't actually exist. Um, and the reason is that once you um, transmediate one uh, thing into another thing, the form changes so much that it effectively can never be that actual thing. So we saw this a lot with our work in uh, uh, digital comics and print comics. Print comics were designed to work within an A4 page, and everything about that uh, form had to do with the ability to link into the page and, and the ability to, to be able to read it and, and to be able to turn it. Um, we can even go so far as to say, if you look at comics such as manga in the East and um, comics in, in the West, which were um, held to rant, well, not held to rant, but held, held to uh, distribution by uh, publishers, and um, comic warehouses where they would only print, uh, print them and sell them once a month. So that the way that the story was then worked needed to link back to be able to create connection with character story arcs. And all these points had to be held over for an entire month, which had a different sort of um, grammar that developed out of that when you compared it to something like manga, which was weekly. Um, so it, in the, the remediation to, to digital was completely different. And um, that's where we started to uh, get into digital comics and start to say, well, if we were going to do digital, how would we do it if there wasn't anything uh, previous to this? So if you could go back in time in a magic time machine and you could say, uh, we're going to make comics and we're going to release them in paper, we have an idea of what that would look like. But what if you didn't have that and you jump straight to digital? What would the differences be? How would you still create meaning? using things like panel arrangements. Um, uh, a lot of the things that comics use to be able to create meaning um, where they have a juxtaposition of imagery in relation to what it is that you see on, on the screen. And ultimately decided that this is a form of smart paper. Therefore, uh, the entire grammar needs to change in order for it to ironically be able to do the same thing. Um, 
But what did happen initially was that comics would take printed comics with PDF format and just put that straight into digital. And that is effectively a transmediation, but it didn't really work very well in terms of theory because it would play more like a watered down animation and really lost a lot of the meaning of com of um, that they came through with how meaning was created in comics. So that's my bold statement is that there's really no such thing. Um, in design theory, we have this idea called uh, skeuomorphic, which is something like this trash can that you see on the right, where it tries to mimic um, the analog or the, the, the reference. Um, but in this case, you can see even then there's a, clear, there's a clear index, but it is a completely different thing. Um, linguistics has a term called anisomorphism, where uh, it's basically the idea of lost in translation, where one word doesn't directly mean another word. And this is the kind of thing that we keep finding when we look into transmedia. It never really relates 100% because you've changed the entire parameters of the space in which uh, the one form has to now adapt to the other form. So again, it leads back to the irony that if for transmedia to be done well, there is um, the necessity for a, a mediation process. In which case that me mediation is what I refer to as re-engineering of the entire spatial parameter, and it effectively becomes an, an, or, a, a new space um, altogether. Um, so there's plenty of examples that we could give there, but if you did, I'll give two broad examples, hypothetical examples. If you had to go back into Shakespeare's time, and let's just say you had a very basic video camera and you locked it up on a tripod and you shot the, the, the play, and then you played it back to someone who went and saw the, the, the live theater show, they'd probably say, this is not theater, it's really watered down bit of theater, I can't engage with the actors, this is no good. Um, however, if you developed that idea of shooting something with a video camera, you could effectively uh, launch into a new medium altogether with film, in which case one is not even necessarily compared to the other so easily, and they both find their own sort of anchor and meaning making processes. So this is my ultimate point about um, transmedia design being done well. So if we go to the next slide. So this is a, that, that's an extension of what I'm talking about. The, the images on the right are my, I guess, um, foray into transmedia with the printed comic into an augmented reality landscape. I spoke a lot about augmented reality yesterday. So those design principles, um, if you look at the yesterday of kind of what I used to try and anchor myself in remediating uh, the process. Um, and the term that I wanna focus on with this slide is the idea of native storytelling. So an example there and where I got the term native storytelling was from uh, James Cameron, um, obviously from Avatar fame. And the uh, examples that I like to use there are the whole idea of 3D film. Coming from a film background, there's a lot of skepticism with 3D film, especially when it first came out, people said it's very gimmicky. That word gimmicky is something that keeps coming up time and time again when transmedia is not done well, because it's done because it can be done, not necessarily because it enhances some sort of connection with story character, uh, all the rules of narratology, um, et cetera. And so people uh, generally said 3D, I think it's been largely by many people dismissed as a, as a gimmick and not really, not really full. Um, the irony I would say is that if you look at the highest grossing film of all time, it is, and I think it's just reclaimed the spot with the re-release re in China um, in preparation for the sequel was Avatar which was scripted with 3D in mind. So from the very conceptual stage, it was thinking, acting, behaving, and encapsulating the story within a three-dimensional space. And um, arguably the film is pretty good and it's, it's done pretty well. And so what Cameron says is that he calls that native uh, 3D filmmaking, unlike the majority of 3D films, which are shot in 2D and then put into 3D in post-production, but the conceptualization of them is not really done three-dimensionally. So that the idea of native storytelling, I think, is um, something that needs to always be revisited and no matter what the transmedia space is. Um, so it's a bit difficult with this talk in particular because there's no specific rules with transmediation because you have to understand the one space and you have to understand the other space and you have to understand, um, have to have some ideas on how to remediate within those spaces and still do justice to this new space. And there are so many, what I call spaces now, augmented reality, virtual reality, mobile theater, I think interactivity, um, it's gonna be a increasingly important haptic game, et cetera. So um, I wasn't really sure where to go next 
um, with this with this discussion. If we go to the next slide, I have one more example that was actually borrowed from the other talk that I gave and I was going, I used this as a template and I, I was going to delete these and then I thought, no, let me keep them because even though I'm using them, I'm remediating them into this talk. So there's a transmediation of the actual slides that I'm looking at. And I think it makes the point really well with, um, if you look at storyboards versus comics, many people say they're the same things but they're not the same things at all um, because the storyboard is done for continuous sampling and to, to, to be given to a, a cinematographer or a camera person to be able to shoot in real time, whereas comics were never meant to be read in real time. They were meant to be read in some sort of um, heightened, hyper-realistic setting um, and playing a lot more with the uh, extending temporalities of, of space and time. Um, so if we go to the next, slide there's this idea of the stage or what i'm calling the space so in in stage uh if we're looking at a stage and we're, we're doing theater production we're thinking of things like blocking um what are the compositional requirements how do those compositional requirements help to uh extend story so upstage downstage set changes all of these um things become techniques that lend themselves to the space of the stage so when we're looking at transmedia, we have to go and think of, well, what is the medium that we are translating to? What is the stage of that? Um, how can we use this space as um, uh, storytelling tools to find its own unique form? So we can go maybe two stages, two slides down. Um, these are general rules because we don't know, uh, not looking necessarily with any specific um, space in mind. So I'm trying to, uh, unearth the principles. Um, so next slide, learning the story wo uh, world rules. So one more down. Um, and these are kind of questions which maybe we can use as start points to try and hack this, this environment. Um, and common, common ideas, a lot of these are taken from ludology and gaming, I find, where we say, well, what are the tactics of the actual world? Um, how, do we, well, how do we identify those? How do we put those into um, patterns and how do we familiarize the audience with them um, and so once we have done these the, these canons uh, find these canons find these consistencies i call them uh, almost a, a palette because once you have the palette developed of the story world those become codes and those lend themselves to self-referential designs um, and some of the tactics that we've seen which i would argue work quite well is if uh, and again if we're looking at story as an anchor depending what kind of story and what kind of structures those lend themselves to, beginning, middle, end, three act structures, uh, hero's journey, what have you. Um, act one is always the orientation phase. Act one is where we teach everything to the audience. Um, so what becomes, uh, what, what uh, ludology does a lot is they bake rules into the game. They show you what you get rewarded for doing. They show you what you get punished for being able to do. Through a process of trial and error, the gamer then learns what their expectations are of that specific game. And these are some things which uh, I think might lend themselves over into uh, transmedia. What, what is my role within uh, these points? Um, I, when we did digital comics, we tried to make it as intuitive as possible so that the idea was that the audience is reading. When you're reading a comic, you don't generally think when you turn the page. Technically, you're engaging, you're interacting. There's a physical relationship between you and story progression, but the reader doesn't necessarily think about it. So we try to mimic that same idea and um, have an intuitive design that hopefully the reader wouldn't realize that they're engaging or doing anything complex at all. And one of the first points that we found out when we started to, to test this out was people were saying they weren't sure what their role in the story was. It's like, well, it's to read. I mean, this is not rocket science, but they really didn't know. They needed to be told uh, what to do. So we gave them, I think, almost too much credit in the beginning because we didn't really tutorialize even the most fundamental um, points and, and rules of the story. Um, once those rules or that palette or those self-referential items have been baked in, uh, then we have the ability to um, do what we would normally do in stories. Once we establish a pattern, then we can use that same pattern to break it. And once we break it, we un undermine, readjust audience expectations. We have some sort of barometer to be able to um, establish meaning from um, creating 
good guys creating bad guys. How do we know they're bad guys? Because they are now being punished for the things that we were rewarding for earlier on. So all of these um, elements become part of uh, storytelling tactics. Um, so going on to the next slide, this term interactivity, I always use it with inverted commas now. Uh, I just write it with inverted commas. I don't even think about it because whenever we're speaking about it in any transmedia term, uh, it means so many different things to different people and there's so many different contexts and the, the meaning of this can shape and it can mean this, but only to a certain point and, and no less. I think part of the reason for this is that we just don't have enough terminology uh, to be able to explain a lot of the kind of subset concepts which are now developing. And I think that we've been able to get away with interactivity up until this point because of the fact that we haven't had the ability to really diversify storytelling because the technology has not been where it is at, at the moment. So I think these new um, rules, ideas, developments are bringing out the need for new language, but at the moment we only really have this language here called um, interactivity. However, it's also something that I think is going to be increasingly, um, as I spoke a bit about yesterday, um, it, it's becoming increasingly, I don't say obvious, I'm just, I'm starting to see signs that uh, traditionally, uh, specifically with things like comic books, with things like um, uh, mediums where you have a beginning, middle, and end, and it's completely decided by the author, um, there's slowly this expectation of engagement and interactivity in order for story to be able to progress. And this hasn't really come too deep into uh, narratology uh, up until this point, um, as much at least as I think it's probably uh, potentially going to going forward. So I am... I, I'm conscious of the fact that this may be something that the narratologists need to start building into their arsenals. How do you tell story um, with a powerful tool like interactivity? And the picture that I used there was a hands picture. And that is because I was a cue to myself is that one of the things that has been um, used, this is an example, but not to the degree that I think it, it potentially could be uh, going, going forward is the idea of touch, which is, um, apparently the most powerful communication tool that we can have with each other. And thus far, we haven't really used this to any great extent in terms of storytelling. We've done this in gaming a bit where you have some sort of haptic control, but um, something like human touch is much more intimate. And once that becomes uh, something that the storyteller then has to write with, it's going to be a tool just like everything else is a tool, um, but it's going to be an extremely powerful tool um, so we may even have to do things like compensate by not having too much information and in background, for example, because it might lead to things like cognitive overload. So I'm not quite sure how these are going to play out with current technology, but it's something that I think going forward um, is going to implement the, the idea of uh, storytelling. And all of these forms are something that can be exploited in terms of uh, character connection, which is... Um, obviously quite essential. So if we go to the next page, um, the idea of transmediation, whatever the space that we're looking at, uh, it's going to have to consider the idea of how does it uh, spatialize story? What are the themes that the, the story can then be spatialized on? This is another storytelling tool. So once we create themes and um, uh, references, uh, that goes back into the idea of canons, consistencies, and in itself becomes a storytelling tool that we might be able to use. Um, and then there's also the link there about no space for clutter. These are going into design principles um, because they have dramaturgical effects and we can overload senses, for example. And the more we tend to overload senses, uh, the more it slows narrative down. This then extends to rhythm of story, which has uh, basically like a domino effect with uh, things like... Um, dramatic overload and, and rhythmic functions. Do we want it to speed up, slow down, um, et cetera, things along these lines. And then we also can consider there the, obviously the associations that we are trying to establish with space and meaning and story and theme and all of these other points that need to integrate uh, with each other. So if we go to the next slide, this, I don't know how well you can see it and I'm not sure how well, uh, how many of you played Super Mario Brothers 3 but obviously the greatest game of all time. Anyways, the point is that uh, this is basically a level map um, that was designed by a guy called Rick Burns. And um, it's quite interesting because it allows you an overview one shot of the entire world of Super Mario Brothers. And if you start looking at the different worlds 
as in the different levels, you can start to see the separation of colors, but uh, and even though it's a bit small, you can get the idea that this is separation of different space. So space becomes a progression tool. And there's lots of cool little things you can start to do when you look at the spaces and how they juxtapose and where they slot in chronologically into the order of things. So right off the bat, things like, for example, we generally have a midpoint, which um, um, in, in many Western stories and, and many stories in general, they have the idea of the, the known world and the unknown world. Um, and if you look right here, um, right about the middle, you'll see that there's a bit of water. And in fact, what we're doing is we're going from world to cloud. So there's a, a clear uh, bipolar separation, which is not something that you're necessarily conscious of when you're playing, but subconsciously, you. I think the idea is to translate that you're getting further away from home and you're getting more into the idea of the unfamiliar. And you'll also see then once we go from a place in the clouds, we go back to greenery which I think is almost a, a break and a cleanse, the calm before the storm, usually happens at the bottom of the second act so that we can launch straight into the, the, the final confrontation, which in this case is underground, which we haven't really spent much time underground in the, the levels before. And everything ramps up, the colors are a bit uh, more bold, aggressive, and the idea of danger um, emanates. So this is going back to the idea of what palettes do we have available and how do we use them for progression for a progressing story. And um, on the next page, I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, but I was battling whether to bring this in or not, but it goes back to the idea that if we have um, these tools available to us, I think when we go back to the idea of the stage and we go look at film, theater, comics, et cetera, it's always a, uh, designed 100% by the authorship. And I think one of the reasons for this is that practically uh, there was no expectation of too much other than that. We do have interactive theater, but all these uh, branching narratives, interactivity, they've always been kind of kept to the side of mainstream. And so I wanted to bring up the concept because, as I say, I think this is something that, um, while it's on the side at the moment, it's already been evident within the, the discussions here in the last two weeks that this point keeps coming up. Um, it's referred to under different banners, but as I said to it yesterday, it's the idea of ludonarrative dissonance, where Whenever you have some sort of interactivity or control or agency by the user, which has many um, functions that lend themselves to story because of their ability to pull the user into the world, they also run the risk of giving almost um, so much control that it takes away from the path set up by the, the narrator. And that, that, that gap is referred to as dissonance, uh, ludonarrative dissonance. So, there is an example which I thought of bringing in, but I, I didn't bring it in, but um, we have seen some examples of where this dissonance is mitigated in story and it becomes a, a extremely powerful uh, because it's almost like it has the best of both worlds. Um, but the cue here is a little case study, which I'll end the, the, the talk with. And it was when we were working with the company, the digital comics company made fire and what they wanted to do is get major publishers on their platform. So uh, they were in talks with DC Comics and they showed DC what they could do in bringing digital to life. And the idea was that you had windows of animations, which were more like cinemagraphs. So it brought animatic elements, but it wasn't designed to be an animation. It was designed to be anchored within a reading experience. And as soon as DC saw this, the first thing that they said is we can do an interactive story. And this threw Made Fire a curveball because that's not what they wanted to do. They wanted to do short, memorable comics that people could access on their phone in a remediated space. Um, they didn't want to tell DC no, however, because it's DC and to have Batman on the platform is a really big deal. So they eventually decided that the best way to deal with this was to give DC their way and that they would eventually come to the, the idea themselves that maybe this is not what they wanted to do. And that's exactly what happened because they ended up creating this um, interactive narrative with multiple endings. And one of the things that they didn't think of is that from a practical point of view, that means you have to create 30 different endings, which means it's a lot more work. So it took them about a year to develop it. And by the end of it, you had a whole bunch of non-starter stories, which were not all that satisfying. And you only already had one actual story arc. And they decided that with all the, the money and effort and everything that went into it, it probably made more sense to just to uh, more kind of linear uh, narratives to, to be told. Um, but anyways, I wanted to bring that point up because I think it keeps coming up. And so that's really the, 
the, the well, okay, so there's one more slide which leading on for that is the idea of code generation. This is something I see more and more. For example, um, I see this with reaction videos, which to me are kind of silly, but at the same time, I also understand the idea of reaction videos because it's a way for people to be able to share their experiences. And that's also something that seems to constantly be coming into the, the storytelling arsenal. It might be something that narratologists need to start thinking about um, along with everything else that they consider as well. And that is the talk. So thank you for your time. That's great. Thank you very much, Damien. That was really interesting uh, and just loads and loads of food for thought again. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. Thank you. OK, I'll just stop the share and then try and find you guys again. Just bear with me. There you are. Hello. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to move swiftly on and introduce uh, Simon and Myra. Just find the right. Uh, here we are. OK. Are you ready, guys? So, Myra Apina and Simon Wilkinson set up Bright Black in 2019 to explore the radical potential of immersive technologies to create playable interactive experiences that democratize, disrupt, and decolonize our culture. Their works have toured 36 countries on five continents, featuring at venues including Tate Modern, an abandoned toilet in the Arizona desert. And they have hundreds of labs, consultancies and commissions with universities and institutions such as the Royal Shakespeare Company, the British Council and Sydney Opera House. They also mentor emerging and underrepresented artists with the aim of creating a new paradigm for culture that gives power back to the individual and the community. There are no opening titles and no end credits. You find the story. Over to you guys. Cool. Thanks, Heather. No worries. So... Uh, Simon, you're sharing. Coming um, up. Yeah. Cool. There you go. So, uh, yeah, so that's the intro. This is us um, in a sort of transmedia guys um we yeah as heather said we're making um playable participatory culture we want to reach audiences and build new audiences and part of that is really um exploring new forms of story so you can skip ahead yeah so we got comic book versions of us that um go around doing terrible things um and this is our show reel Okay, so happily our presentation slots quite nicely with Damien's. There's not too much repetition. Um, and this sort of we sort of go off in some slightly different directions. So first of all, I'm going to show you this um diagram, which is a diagram by Walt Disney drawn in 1957. And what it shows is I guess a map of how to exploit an intellectual property and render as much pro profit from it as po possible. So, you know, merchandising, you know, t-shirts, toothbrushes, and so on and so forth. Taking something like Mickey Mouse and making a thousand things out of it, not just an animation. And this idea kind of, um, actually quite a few people who talk about transmedia storytelling, people like Frank Rose reference how uh, manga took that and turned it into something which was a little bit more story based. And then we have examples like um, probably most famously Star Wars, which sort of did a really awful job at the beginning. 
of transmedia storytelling so if you if you know the story of um, star wars and it wasn't expected to be a big hit and then it was and suddenly christmas was coming and they wanted to exploit it so they made a christmas special and you can see here the problem with the transmedia universe of star wars at the beginning you have a universe which is thousands of years before uh, earth was created tens of thousands of years before earth was created and yet we have Darth Vader wearing a Santa Claus hat. And in the actual uh, Christmas special that they created, the Wookiees were celebrating something that on the Wookiee planet was very similar to Christmas. And the whole thing was kind of ludicrous and, and is embarrassing for people who are fans of this franchise, this and the Ewok movie. And so for a better example of what transmedia might mean and what we how we think, think of it, we go back to Philip K. Dick and something that he said in a lecture that he was giving. He said, he asked the question, how do you build a universe that doesn't fall apart after two days? And when we're thinking about transmedia storytelling, what we're thinking about is telling a story that is on multiple platforms all at the same time, but which is in within a consistent universe. And effectively, that is what reality is. We are all wondering, Robert Anton Wilson said, we're all wandering around in our own reality tunnel. And that reality tunnel is constructed from newspaper articles, things you read on the internet, things you've grown up with, religious mythologies, and so on and so forth. And none of it is ultimately real, um, but all of it feels incredibly real. And that is a transmedia universe that you're in. Our, our role as artists in a way is to break that and create new ones and to raise really important questions within it that um, fracture the paradigm one way or another. So, and if uh, you were in our talk the other day where we talk about new power, with new power, we're talking about these newer platforms from the last 15, 20 years, which give a lot of agency to our audiences, not only just to be interactive, or to have a story adapt to them as they move through it, but also they can work together, which is exactly what New Power is about, and they can make really profound things happen. So when we're telling stories in a transmedia way, we've got New Power in the back of our minds. And so I'm going to give you an example. So this show, um, it's actually just from a few years before we formed Bright Black, but really is the reason we formed Bright Black. Myra made a show called Somni. I made a, a show called Whilst the Rest of Sleeping. They were both very large scale shows, which were transmedia in nature. Um, and we learned lots of lessons from those. And we, we created Bright Black in a way to sort of move forward from those two experiments. So Whilst the Rest of Sleeping um, was based on something whereby when I was 13 years old, uh, my grandfather used to come around once a week to have dinner. And when he would come, he would bring me a little bit of pocket money or a gift or something. And one, one day in 1982, when he came, he brought this magazine called Mysteries of the World. And you can see the story on the front cover disappeared, the strange story of how nine people simply vanished into the Great Basin Desert. Well, when I was 13, uh, one of the things still actually that I enjoy doing the most is dreaming. And what I would do is when I went to bed, I would read this magazine and particularly this story because it was so freakish that it would give me really wild nightmares and dreams. And uh, it was like being in virtual reality before virtual reality really existed. And in 2014, I got commissioned for this arts venue in Australia, which is Federation Square. So Federation Square, as you can see, it's a 10,000 capacity venue. It has no doors on it. It's all funded by a car park at the back. And so all the commissions are funded by that. And what that means is that everyone can come. There's no tickets to get in. Everything's free. And when they gave me this commission, they didn't, I'd already done commissions for them before. They trusted me and they just said, you know, make a show, bring something. And I'd been interested in the early examples from the, when I say early, I mean sort of 2000s, 2004, 2005, examples of transmedia story, which, storytelling, which were really exciting, which was things like uh, Nine Inch Nails, Year Zero, um and why so serious which is a transmedia campaign for batman and so i wanted to make something number one that went back to this story that really excited me when i was a kid and number two that i could do in a transmedia way the first thing i did when i got the commission was look up the story again 
And I discovered that not only was it a real story, but there was a museum in uh, Idaho in a town called Burley that held evidence and artifacts from this disappearance that happened. And I'll tell you the story so you get the gist and, and, and the objects that I had access to. So in 1959 in Idaho, in a place called Albion, there was a school that was only three years old. Um, and in this school, there was a morning where eight school um, students, all 17, 18 years old, and their science teacher went on a field trip uh, in the school bus and at the end of the day they didn't return and with for the first two weeks nothing was discovered that gave any hint of where they were there were obviously call outs over the radio over the newspapers and people were trying to find evidence of where they were there was images of people walking hand in hand across scrubland trying to find any remnants of clothes or anything and they couldn't find anything but then two weeks later um the school bus was discovered uh, an hour and a half drive north, 10 miles into the Great Basin Desert, and it was, it had been set on fire and it was completely destroyed. And not far from there was discovered a shack um, which had in it a table, and on that table were eight letters waiting to be found. And those eight letters were written by the school, uh, the students, and they were to their parents and loved ones, and they were saying goodbye. And the letters are extremely strange. And so this story is a great story and I wanted to explore it more and I wanted to tell that story. So initially the way it worked was this. So if you look at that venue there on the stage uh, and above the stage is a massive screen. So what the, the light, the thing that's lighting all those people up in the square is a huge screen. So the biggest screen in the Southern, Southern hemisphere. So I made a feature length documentary film, which told the story of the master's appearance. And whilst it was playing through, um, there were eight young students on stage, all 17, 18 years old, who were sat at school desks. And as the film played, they would stand up and they would read extracts from the original letters. Uh, I was on one side of the stage playing a live score and electric, electronic music instruments. And on the other side of the stage was a string quartet who were accompanying me. So you had this sort of live film. But most people would have heard about this from before they arrived at the venue. Um, they would have heard that uh, me on television and on radio and in newspaper articles that I did when I first arrived. So I would go into a TV studio. I'd be interviewed. They'd say, why, why did you make the show? I'd explain the story of the comic. I would tell the story. And obviously, people would start going online and searching the story. So I knew that when people arrived, they'd already know a fair amount. So then we performed the film. At the moment, if you think in a transmedia way, they've heard me on radio, they've read articles in newspapers, they've um, seen me on TV, and now we have a film with live performers, live electronic music soundtrack. And within the square was also an augmented reality trail. Now, one of the characters in this story was a person who didn't disappear, but who was left behind. It was a brother of one of the people who disappeared, who wrote a novel about the disappearance and then made a record, uh, like a, a music album, um, which reference had references in it, in it and so on. And one of, he wrote a number of books and one of them was unfinished when he died in 2010. And it had images, uh, when, they, when he died, they found images and notes for this new novel. So I had those images and notes around the square. And if people had their smartphone, they could install an app and it would give more details from other things that this person had done. At the back on the left there is the Australian Centre for the Moving Image, and inside there were 17 virtual reality installations. Each of these, and it's interesting what Damien said, because these were VR with a lot of physical touch. So every person who came through this held the hand of a performer at some point at a critical moment in the story. And as Damien correctly said, this is a really powerful thing. And I know Myra talks about touch um, in the things she experienced before she made Somni as well. And there were smells in the VR. There was um, physical movement through space and kinesthetic storytelling in the way that we described um, in one of the other talks that we did. In the very back, that green building is a, is a gallery and in there were cabinets which contained the original letters and other objects and artifacts from the case. And so there was a lot already. There were many different media that were telling this story all at the same time. But uh, more importantly, 
we live in the age of smartphones. Obviously, we're a long way into that already by 2014. And so we knew people were going online, but we were measuring how many people went online because what they would find when they went online was about 30 websites and Wikipedia pages that covered this mass disappearance. What the audience didn't know was the whole story was fake because this wasn't about mass disappearance at all. This was about this was literally about propaganda and marketing and advertising and how it's done in a transmedia way and what that means for us, how we create universes of reality. And so all those websites were created by me. All the, uh, all, obviously all the other stuff you saw was created by me, but the, uh, the websites were all created by me, which means we could measure how many people were going through those websites at any time. Um, and people were discovering a much bigger story when they went there. Not only were people pe discovering a bigger story, but they were staying in the story for a good two weeks. Uh, this show eventually went to about 30 countries and it was it was absolutely normal for audiences to be navigating and exploring this story for two weeks. Not only that, but they would be emailing pe people who were effectively characters in a fake story to find out more from the museum, for example. So I would be in my hotel answering emails as the museum director or the museum director's wife, depending on how I felt that day. Uh, or they would be getting contact with people on social networking, fake accounts that I created. And so they were having these interactions, which were driving them deeper and deeper into the story. Um, and this brings an interesting point to bear, which is that initially on the radio interviews and on the TV and in the, in the newspapers, what they were expecting was a stage based show. They weren't told about anything else. They certainly weren't told that they could go online because we don't need to tell people that. They know they can go online. And there's an interesting thing. So I always use this diagram um, to express it. When an audience, say it was 1890, whatever that was, 1894, 1895, the first time anybody went into a room and there was a film projector projecting on the wall, they had never seen this before and they freaked out. They screamed, they fainted, they hid under the tables because they thought they were gonna be run over by the train that was coming towards them in the film. Um, by the time we get to 2014, you have these magnificent buildings, which are cinemas. And when people walk in, they barely pay any attention to it because we've really set about, uh, we've, we've created a set of expectations uh, whereby they know that the fiction happens on this square, this oblong in front of them. They know that there's a invisible border, well, quite a visible border between the edge of the screen and the seats that they're in. They know that reality is where they're sitting and fiction is within the screen. And they know that reality is the moment before the lights go down. And when the lights go down, fiction begins. And when the lights come up again, fiction is over and we're back into reality. And in a way, what we were able to do with whilst we were sleeping was really tinker with those expectations and put things in places no one expected it. And because we didn't need to tell them to go online, they felt they'd found those things for themselves. So that when I was doing this show in New Zealand, people were coming to the show with, particularly older people were coming with printouts of Wikipedia pages they found to show me that they'd found some other stuff that I probably hadn't found. And so I was collecting it and it was you could see that these people felt like they were part of an investigative team that were helping to solve this mystery. And at the end of this show, what happens, and I had to do this to be responsible in a way, was to put in a website which gave the game away. And then what happened was an audience Q&A at the end of each run. And at the audience Q&A, I would admit what I'd done as a way of starting a, a dialogue around the real question. And that question was, how do we trust the source of information we have? How do we know what's real in a world dominated by paid for professional, what Hunter S. Thompson calls professional bullshit? Um, so what we did with Transmedia there was to have a live show, which was the announced content, but unannounced was this massive world, this massive universe. And effectively what I'd done is create a huge world which the audiences could play around in. But it's interesting also to note that that world grew on the basis of audience interactions as I taught. So for example, in New Zealand, where there are about five people live there. So when they get someone on the radio who's from overseas, you unlike the uk where you get like three minutes and they give you two seconds to say anything 
they started asking questions at 11 a.m. And at midday, they were still asking questions. And they were asking questions I hadn't thought of answers to yet in the story. So I was making the story up as I went along. And then I had to go to my hotel room and make more websites to fill in the gaps. And also audiences were sending messages and asking questions. And sometimes they would think of things or they'd ask questions of the, uh, the museum director, for example, that hadn't cropped up in the story. So we're, I was adding more content as it went. And so there was this feedback loop between me and audiences, which is really fascinating. And I think is moves on to, we were talking about speculative design in, in another talk the other day, and it really feeds into that. And there's a slide, which Mara's going to talk about. You're muted. Yeah. So what we started to do was take these worlds and these transmedia universes and think about, you know, the actual lens we were applying to it, which is a speculative design idea, which is at the heart of these worlds, there's a question implanted in it. And it's the audience is trying to answer that question because in new spaces like metaverses or games or you know, virtual worlds, whatever you want to call them. We have the capacity to gather, you know, thousands of brains, um, which is much more interesting way of answering a question, answering a question about who we are or questions of our times um, or why we're here, which is essentially what the cultural conversation is about. So now we have thousands of people in, in that space that can answer it. Um, and so when it came to uh, the, sh the big show that I made just before we set up Bright Black called Somni, I was thinking about artificial intelligence, um, but as in subverting that and thinking about how, what if AI was spiritual matter? So that it went past the sort of dystopian idea or the mechanics or um, the kind of shape of stories that we've seen many times, which is that bad AI comes to destroy us. And within that process and watching like thousands of people go through this experience was the fact that critical moment in the story when the AI character breaks your trust, most people still followed them, followed them through into sort of this dark and difficult um, uh, basement section of the experience. And the question really emerged, a speculative design question. Are we so immured that we will default to any God? And um, if we go to the next slide, um, in a strange similarity to the work that Simon was doing, I wanted the um, kind of message to come from the Somni character itself. So the whole world that we built around Somni was about this um, spiritually transcendent um, artificial intelligence. And it was a huge warehouse space that we converted into a multi-sensory, multi-layered experience, which had um, a live cast um, of like 30 performers, VR installations, augmented reality. But essentially the physical space was um, the sort of um, territory that was your subconscious mind. So when this AI talked to you, they wanted to talk to you in a language that they knew that you would understand. So you saw them appear as um, video or large posters across the tube, um, across motorways, and they were talking to you as come and into the sleep experience where we're gonna sub explore the subconscious mind. And in mastering that last territory that you have not have no control over, you'll learn to love more, earn more, you're gonna be this uh, more spectacular person. So you never see that this is a show, um, that you're coming to a, an experience that starts at this time in this venue and ends at this time. You are ready, as soon as you see these posts where you start engaging with this content online, you're already in the world and your imagination is already um, placing you in the story. And so when you first come to the venue, you just go to the next slide. So 
something strange is happening to my interface. I can see an angel and a lass sitting in front of her. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, no, my, I think my screen's frozen or something strange. Weird, that's never happened before. Um, it's if the you, Omni. <laughs> yeah, if you flick the slide and just tell me what, I think I'll remember what's on it and then I'll reset my screen. But um, yeah, so when you first come to the experience, you meet the character and they tell you this fairy story about um, in order to send you to sleep, um, into a deep sleep. Um, and they tell you the story about how a young child is going to go, goes into the woods carrying all their material, be, um, all their material wealth. And as they go deeper and deeper, they have to shed that. And then the somni pulls out a napkin and pricks their finger and a drop of blood falls on their finger. And this is where the story first branches, but not in a traditional sense, as in you go this way, you go that way. If you see that moment, then that image will recur and it will tell you something later in the story. And you follow the song line, you go into this um, essentially collective VR experience, just like this huge round bed where they send you into hypnosis and these projections open up um, above you and you're sent through um, into this sort of other universe and you start to explore that so um, at one time you're flying in the air which is this um, next uh, slide is that up yeah yeah and then you go into you master this flying dream and again the sense of the kinesthetic sense so using different types of media you're on a chair that kind of lifts you up but because you're in VR when you look down at your feet your feet rise up and you're in the clouds and then you look above and you're flying towards the sunset um, and at that time a fan comes down which you can't see because you're in the headset and blows, blows a breeze in your face so you feel like you're really soaring through the sky as you land you go into the next um, more adventurous exploratory territory where you go to into this free roam VR experience, which again uses, um, obviously you're moving in the space. You've got uh, a real bridge in the real space. And when you uh, reach out, when you put your VR headset and reach out and touch it, the bridge is really there, but there are planks missing. So you start to get this people um, are sort of becoming the story. The story is becoming viscerally happening within them as they can't step on the planks because they believe that um, they're missing. And these two senses are combining. Their eyes are telling them planks aren't there. Yeah, so that was us prototyping that um, scene and um, realizing the sort of power of um, uh, introducing the body in a in a like sort of fully immersed way into the story. And when you come out of your headset, also playing with the idea of this um, fiction, where is the fiction happening? When you come out of your headset and you're going through as a group of six that you've really bonded with up to this point, um, one of you is missing. So while you're in virtual reality, this part of the story has happened outside your headset and you're sent into a real exit if you want to go and pursue who they are, uh, where they are. Um, so lots of different stuff happens. You go into a basement and the second part of this fairy story is told to you and it doesn't go well. Um, and then are we on the bed slide now? Yeah, yes. Yes, um, you emerge into this um, final experience, which is that you're going to dream in order to awaken. And according to the decision you make, you either ascend into a sort of cosmic dust or you descend into the ground. And so um, the in the logic of the AI and the fact that um, you've beholden yourself to a sort of godlike figure and you followed their morality and you followed their construction of spirituality, um, you sort of sacrificed yourself in this ex in this experience. Um, but also when you come out, um, there's a far space, which is really about people discovering that they've all been on a different journey and they've all had a different 
experience, not just in the sense of the story branching, um, but how they felt on many different layers of um, through, you know, being guided through places and also being free running through some terrifying scenes. And so the bar was like buzzing and the conversation was really wild, um, which is amazing because then the story is growing again. Um, and you had um, an app which tracked your um, vitals so people could see their heart rate throughout the experience, which they then shared on social media, which then became part of a marketing thing itself. So without us having to say, oh, the experience is thrilling or it does this or it does that, people just sharing a screen grabs of their heart rate um, did all that conversation for us. And then within that, uh, people started to turn up to the experience um, in their pajamas. Uh, they started to, you know, come dressed up. There, there was a realization, um, and it's really built around emergent behavior for us as well. That in these sort of like non traditional spaces, there is so much latitude for you to be creative and you to have agency. And the rules are really decoded in terms of like walking into a cinema or a theater, you know how you have to behave. You know you have to be quiet and sit down and look at things happening in front of you. But here it's like people felt it was their world because they are co-creating the story. If they weren't in the story, the story wouldn't happen. And so uh, before they would come and they'd, you know meet up in a bar in London in their pajamas, and then everyone would be talking to them about why are you wearing your pajamas? And then the story would spread that way. Then they would come to the experience and they would feel like it's their own because they're, they've they added some creativity to it. Um, and that's really the beauty of creating a possibility space where um, your audience or your participants um, have so much creative um, exploration and so many um, avenues to explore that really the idea of who is the artist and who is the creator, who are the critics and who are the audiences is really being remixed. And so one of the things we're thinking about just as a thought to sort of bring it to a close, when we're making work, which is across multiple platforms all at the same time, you can see that in Mara's one, there's sort of a pathway to follow. And in Whilst the Rest of Sleeping, it's really, there's a starting point, which is either uh, an interview that I've done on TV, or if you've seen that, or it's the stage show, and that kicks off. It sort of opens up a universe within which you roam at your own uh, level. So some, as I said, some people remain there for two weeks. Some people are there for a couple of hours. People take their own route and direction through it. People make their own decisions. With emergent behavior, as mentioned in Myra's, you are essentially creating this world where people can not only um, do the things you intend, but lo do loads of things that you don't intend. And by doing that, you can change the world and evolve it and move it forward. And it becomes more of an interaction between you as the artists and the audience as your community around the artwork. Um, and transfer rate thinking is about we need to make sure that the story is good enough that people are driven from platform to platform rather than the reverse that each step uh, loses a number of people. Um, and we talked, one of the other talks, we talked about game system design and thinking about the hormones and chemicals that exist within a human body that are triggered by certain experiences and how if you create an experience correctly, then you'll take people into flow states which look like this and if you think about this as a metaphor you see these two women hurtling down a mountain the mountain is the world um, there are some limitations and uh, that make it compelling uh, the idea is to get from the top to the bottom in one piece um, the means to get down there is a board with four wheels on it outside of that in the last 50 60 years there's been so much experiment experimentation iteration the boards themselves have changed in the nature of how they look and what their abilities are the way people ride them has changed with iteration and, and innovation and what we want to do is make artworks where people do those kinds of things within the artwork itself rather than just receiving a linear story which has been scripted for them because the, we're in the era we're in now is about this not about a novel you read from cover to cover and 
that's that's it and that's all there is to it um so that's where we're going to leave you um in the presentation wow <laughs> amazing amazing thank you very much i've heard that already and i just love it <laughs> It's even better with the retelling. <laughs> so I was transfixed yeah. from being the end. No, totally, totally. Okay, so um, uh, question from Olivia. Okay, from, hello from immersive stories. Do people take the narrative away from the experience or the feeling from the narrative? Like the propaganda museum piece, even though all of the information is fake, does that take away or invalidate how the audience felt? Likewise, it's a bigger question on how we view fictional stories, how they make us feel. It might not literally be real, but the feelings were real. Is this a consequence or a virtue? Which is no, well, the heavy question. <laughs> considering that mentions the whilst I was sleeping, I'll, I'll tackle that first. So all fiction stories, good ones, have some resonance on your everyday life and that's that's what makes them interesting when things are so uh when things well if you look at star wars i mentioned that basically star wars is earth with a twist right like when you see uh you're on some planet somewhere and there's some people on some speeders and they're wearing leather jackets with studs in you know they're bikers right there is basically you know one step removed from earth and the and the stories in Star Wars are trying to draw upon themes that mean something to us as individual audience members in the same way as when the Beatles write a love song, they write it so that it means something to you, no matter whether the story in the, you know, they try and write it abstract and broad enough so that it means something to you, because that, that's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened with Ross's sleeping that was really interesting, because it is a two way communication. Number one, what was very obvious was it's very easy to convince people of realities which they want to believe in and it's very hard to dissuade them of realities that aren't true that they want to believe in mm -hmm. and we've seen some really good examples of that you know in in the last 10 years in politics for example and so there were quite a few people who when they were told it wasn't real started thinking that what that that was the bit that wasn't real and uh, and they need some people needed some persuading that it wasn't real because they found so much information about it online they couldn't quite believe that one person had created all that information uh, but that was the kind of the point i guess in, 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 when you look at the intention of the artwork it was to show demonstrate that propaganda is easy and we know like i think we said this in one of the presentations last week we can easily convince people of things even with just text so when we've got all these other technologies that are really compelling and really um, seductive, it's it's a simple thing to create to create a new reality, and people are doing it all the time. But they're usually doing it for money, for brands, for political campaigns, and so on and so forth. So initially, some people were really um, disappointed when they found out it wasn't real until they found out that the whole thing was done for a reason. And I think that's it, it's how I felt when I used to. I remember probably about. 1990, I saw um, uh, the uh, the American comedian Bill Hicks deliver a performance on a, a recorded TV show, and it was incredibly compelling, and there was so much truth in it. And then about six months later, I saw exactly the same um, performance recorded a second time in another place, and I felt really disappointed because he seemed so he was delivering these things as if he was feeling the emotions in the real time. But that's the point. When you're making artwork, we're taking you on a journey to take you to a critical question that we're asking. And sometimes that does involve disappointment when you find out it isn't real. It's a bit like the um, the concept of the corridor of truth that Tim Powell was talking about in his talk, you know, where you take people on a journey, but at the end there's this debrief moment almost where you're saying right okay well we made it up <laughs> but yeah and then you're explaining why and and the you know the reasoning behind that and i think i think you're right i think if the audience knows there's a reason for it and it's not just you're not just deceiving them for fun um but there's actually a kind of a point to it and, and having that reveal at the end it, it kind of shifts the dynamic i would say I don't know what you think. yeah i guess it's like what's the impact of that so like 
quite fascinatingly like these were uh, the performers we used were real people um playing this ai character and many people were wondering if they were real or not mm -hmm. um and it sort of points to so we didn't tell them obviously there was no need to tell them because they're in you know there's no sort of real world like negative impact um of them re you know really sort of being able to live in their imagination of was that real or wasn't it and in that way the story continues because every time they think about that they're back in the story wondering if it was real and it points to similar to what Simon's saying like why do we need to believe what what's under the hood like Terence McKenna the psychedelic legend of the 60s um, was always put on the spot because they were trying to discredit him there was a lot of um, support for the movement people were really experimenting and every time he went on a, a panel or an interview thing the old guy would be like oh but you're a kook you're and just try to discredit them as much as possible oh you believe in UFOs and he said Ah, I do. I don't believe in UFOs, but I don't not believe them. The question is, why do we all need to believe in UFOs at the moment? Because there was a social phenomenon happening, particularly in America, of sightings of all you know these transmedia stories going on about aliens and blah blah blah. So there was a need to believe, and I think that's the critical question about who we are. Mm -hmm. This is why I was, although I've heard your story already, I really enjoyed hearing it the second time. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's that needing to feel part of a, you know, the, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? Okay. Um, question for you. Uh, sorry. Question for you, Damien. What is the main difference between interactivity and agency? I think in uh, many respects, they can be the same thing, or at least they can overlap. But if you're asking me, what I would say is that interactivity is some way to engage um, with the narrative um, outside of a passive response. Um, whereas agency, um, agency is really the idea of, of personalization, of somehow interpolating you into the narrative so that you become part of the story that you are consuming. And this, uh, narratively speaking, has, um, I guess you could call it advantages of um, effect. So emotion, engagement, um, you process uh, the events with a, not from a degree of distance, but from a very um, personalized subjective stance. So they can be the same thing, but I think they have two different uh, focuses, whereas interactivity, you might not necessarily need to be in the same world as the characters, for example in order to be able to interact in, in some way. So that's why I say interactivity is a, it's a broad term um, and it, it has a whole lot of connotations depending on context. Okay, Simon, when can transmedia storytelling cheapen a story or, or does it, I guess is the question. Well, I think the, um, the Star Wars, the early Star Wars example is a clear one. And <laughs> I think when, when it becomes patently obvious that a story is being told across multiple platforms merely to uh make more money um and like so in my when i did my degree both Maya and i weirdly went to business school and, and um i did my year out working for a pharmaceutical company and one of the things they did was they uh licensed the characters from the simpsons to put them on toothbrushes there was no extra story being told by these toothbrushes. There was nothing to glean. There was no extra. There was just, you're a fan of the sim. It's probably parents buying it rather than kids, right? Yeah. My kids want, I need them to brush their teeth. I'm going to make it more likely by putting Bart Simpson on their toothbrush. From the, from everybody involved in that scenario, apart from the, you know, the, the mother or father who buys the toothbrush, their reason for doing it is to make bundles of cash and buy a yacht. And that is not compelling in the slightest. Um, and you can see what's happened with the Star Wars franchise is that as it got bought out, the storytelling and the way that the different elements of story from different, I mean, with, with Star Wars, it's still really TV, animation and film, but they're starting to slot together really nicely. And it's, it's been hilarious watching how 
the sort of more modern writers are trying to write the ludicrous storylines from the early things into these more sophisticated stories that are coming out in the in the contemporary versions now. But the but I think the thing that was really that came out of that, which was probably unexpected, was how important the plastic characters was in the 70s and 80s. Those plastic characters, A, sold loads. Mm -hmm. um, but B, what it meant was that, you know, my brother and I would sit and make up our own Star Wars stories. Um, and so the universe grew uh, on the basis of our interactions. And I think Damien mentioned that. It's a thing where, War I think it was Warner who tried to sue loads of teenagers for creating their own Harry Potter websites and it massively backfired. Mm -hmm. It created such a lot of bad feeling, but it was also a missed opportunity, just like with Whilst I Was Sleeping, where by listening to what um, the audience are doing in the universe you create for them, you then begin to mold and shape and shift the, um, the universe. Because at the end of the day, this universe I created is about a question that's really important for all of us. It's not just about making money. It's not just like dump the story on them, let them play around in it and then make another one when we want to make some more money. It was a genuine inquiry. Um, and so uh, I think it was Warner who backed off from suing teenagers for making their own websites. But uh, Lost, the series Lost actually took that a step further where they were putting things into an episode that they didn't have an answer for. So they had a sequence of numbers that turns up at one point in Lost. They didn't know what that sequence of numbers was going to be until they looked at the forums and what people were saying on the forums about these numbers and what they were thinking it might be. And they essentially took the best ideas and wrote them into the story. And that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, it's not quite 100% there in terms of where we will be with technology. But if you can think about a, universe, a world where we can make stories which are really cohesive and adaptive to audiences, which is video games are by far, leading that but you can see it can, it can get much cooler when we have like really um clever ai and things working alongside us brilliant thank you uh, myra what to what extent did the experience rely on audience participation yeah so really interesting because it's one of the key things that came up was about how willing you are to suspend your disbelief how willing you are to be present as well so in all our efforts to like onboard people as in you're on a busy London street you know you've just come from work or whatever it is and now we're asking you to be in um, this magic space where there's transcendent AI allowing you to explore your subconscious mind um so you know there's obviously stuff we did like every single person you encounter is in character you enter a very warm dark space with music um <laughs> that is putting you in a, a certain mindset um and these you know we work really hard so there's really no cracks in the seams as well like every time you put your headset is referred to as a sleep mask um every kind of interaction like or it's like a seam is a moment for a story. So where we had hold rooms, we, um, to, if there are any tech difficulties, we made them into parts of the story and you never knew. So then it's kind of how you're doing all this work to create a coherent, consistent universe where people feel they're not being pulled out of it. Mm -hmm. And the more you're this, um, able to really go there, and the more you come with an open mind and wanting that sort of immersion. So those that were like, is it a real character? Like, is that a real AI or really just letting go? Mm -hmm. And this is something, you know, that we're all, um, that we're, we, we lost a lot, I guess, with the sort of mechanical, rational, kind of 19th century, you know, science-based way of seeing things, which is obviously one way of seeing the world. And we moved away from myths and mysticism and being able to, you know, see like that. So I, I feel like these layered stories and these new ways of creating unexpected, you know, unexpected moments and surprises that are delivering immersion, allowing people to let go, allowing people to imagine and escape and all of these things, because that's what we need. That's what's really lacking in the real world in order to, you know, how are we gonna think of solutions to like massive existential stuff that's going on at the moment? We can't just do it with a mechanical, rational mindset. 
we need creative solutions so it's important as well that we're able to immerse ourselves and be present and let go um, in order to explore um, ourselves I guess amazing question from Maz um, just to kind of leads on a little bit from that in terms of you setting the scene she's interested in how much sound makes your world effective for example soundtracks help create emotion but would a deaf person like Maz um, have a similar experience could you make it could you make it for someone like Maz I'll just say yeah, on that point is that the multi-layered nature of the stories that we're telling are about say if you're a very visual person you can engage in the visuals if you want to go more deeply into interacting with a character and you're interested in the human aspect you could do that if you're um, very sound based there is a sound element to it but also the kinesthetics like we use vibration breeze scent um so we're really you know you could say that a lot of the big broadcast productions are really impoverishing us in terms of experiential stories. And we're trying to get back to something that's very experiential through you know, many senses, not even just the five that we're in the West that we sort of focus on. You know, there are places where they, there are 18 senses, you know, balance, proprioception, um, you know, community, like um, touch is interpreted in many different ways, not just contact, for example. So absolutely, that's a great question. It's um, traditionally seen as like one of the biggest immersive tools, but when you've got all these other senses to play with, it's only one part of the story. Yeah, I, I'll follow on from that to say, if you think about access issues, for example, with something like a movie, if you are visually impaired or hearing impaired, what you, the problems you face when you go to see a movie are the things that are missing for you, right? Uh, if you go into the street and you are visually impaired, you'll have your you'll have the things that you usually use. If you have augmentations that you use, like a stick or whatever like that. Um, I guess ideally what we want to do is make worlds where what you encounter in our artwork is the same as what you encounter in the world. So if you're in the world and you usually encounter vibrations, well, we'll try and put vibrations in there. If what you usually get is smells, then we'll put, try and put smells in there. And in a way, there's a, there was a thing when I was learning to make film. Uh, I did a workshop with um, a film, a cinematographer called Brian Tofano for a week. Uh, he shot um, Train Spotting and Billy Elliot and things like that. And he said that when he was learning to make film, they would do a series of things to see whether the story was working. What they would do is, if they were making a short film, first of all, they'd watch the film without any sound. And was it still possible to perceive the story through the visual storytelling? that was there without the idea of having to put in subtitles. Not that there wasn't going to be subtitles, but could we make it com something that could be comprehended without subtitles? Uh, he said they would play it with just the sound. Was it possible to perceive the story with just the sound? Uh, how was the audio storytelling? And they would also play the film backwards. And in playing the film backwards, could they perceive the story still? And I think these are stress tests for how good your storytelling is. If you're making cinema, um, you know, there are different schools of thought. There's visual storytelling, there's the sound and so on and so forth. They're all telling the story. They're not just soundtrack. The worst case scenario in a movie is that you just load 20 songs onto it because you want to release a, 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 an album that goes with the, to make some more money. And, and it's the same problem as we talked about with transmedia. Good storytellers use the medium for storytelling, not for making more money. Uh, and hopefully they get rewarded with some cash by doing that. Brilliant, that's a great answer, thank you. Um, question for you, Damien, um, from Robbie. At what point does an audience senses get overloaded and what would you say is too much? Um, okay, well, I think I'm gonna launch off of Simon's answer for that. So this is largely an intuitive, um, an intuitive response, I don't know I don't know any way to, to measure this with a calculator or anything like that. So um, the, the anchor is what Simon just said, uh, what's best for story? So this is usually the, the, the question. If it, it, if it pulls you deeper into the story, then that's what we want. If it distracts you or if it takes you out of the story, then there's too much. Um, so if you have a lot of sensory overload and you have dense information, um, what's going on in the scene. It may lend itself to the scene, but 
it may distract you as well. So to give you an example of this, um, the, the talk that I gave uh, the, the other day, um, which I think yesterday, there, there were a series of experiments done with uh, virtual reality and changing up the, changing the scene up and seeing how people responded to the scene. And so there was a bit of a sliding scale that they found is that when they would start to have, this was done at Stanford, um, they'd have a 360 degree scene where people could walk around and do what they want. So thus increasing sensory cognitive load, et cetera. And then they would have another one where they would block off to 180 and then eventually to 45 degrees. Um, so in some sense, the 45 degrees, although it's virtual reality, it's not entirely virtual because there's a lot of stuff that's just blacked out. And what they found is that there was a relationship with the focus and uh, the, the relationship with immersion. So in short, they decided that the 360 was more immersive um, in your ability to engage in, in, sensory, in sensory information. Um, but they found that the shorter they were more focused, there was more focus. And so one of the ways well, that they observed this was to say that um, in the 360 degree scenario, the participants couldn't remember the name of the character that was in the room. And the 45 degree scenario, there were more specifics remembered with character, et cetera. So you're talking about a focalization process. So I think that this is, it depends on what you wanna do, but um, right off the bat to not be able to remember the name of a character, for example, is maybe problematic. So another example I can give is this uh, word that's come up, this like slang word in film called Bayonism. And it really has anything to do with Michael Bay's films which look incredible, um, they're, they're amazing. But people are critiquing the films and they're saying, yes, but so what? Uh, if you look at Transformers, you look at Ninja Turtles, these are great films, they make a lot of money. I'm not knocking them, I enjoy them. But um, you, can, you can substitute the entire actor uh, in, in those films. You don't even need the same main character and people really just don't care. So that connection with character, you can't do that in certain other films so easily. So if you think about, you know, Peter Jackson's films are so character centric, Lord of the Rings, you kill off uh, Gandalf, you have to have a moment because the entire audience is going to weep for that character. Uh, whereas you, you know, you, <laughs> they're basically interchangeable in things like tra Transformers. So I think it depends on what you want to do, but I would go with the answer that, um, story is king. Um, and on that note, there's also, I mean, there's general rules with um, script writing, with, with directing, with um, video game design, is that anything that's seen as clutter is dangerous uh, for this question. So you have to ask yourself, how badly do you need it to be in there? If it's doing more harm than good, then keep it. If it's not, then consider getting rid of it. So I think that's a general approach. Sorry, I muted myself. Ah, brilliant, thank you. Um, so one for you, Myra, from Robbie. Uh, how do you, do you account for audiences making extreme choices? Wow, that's a good question. So it's a great question because we were talking about emergent behaviour, obviously, and we're trying to create a scenario where people feel very free and able to um, be creative. And so you have to, um, you know, design... You have to understand the psychology of people. So why is it happening? For example, in Somni, we had, it would always be the giant guys who came in probably um, posturing. Now, remember they're in a group of six, so whether they came with a few friends, or whatever. And so you're really trying to work with the group dynamic. And a lot of story was coming out of that, but also the potential for it to go for people to get annoyed with each other, for someone to behave in a way that was like inappropriate or took someone else out of the story. So, you know, let alone all the other layers of stuff going on, there's these, all these group things and you're dealing with humans. So you never know what they're going to do. So the, the kind of strategy was um, I just followed groups around and I observed people in the system I guess and how they were behaving at what critical moments and when you got a pattern of oh at this moment 
you know, these type of people tend to go into this space and it's very disruptive. And although we want them to be creative, we don't want them to negatively affect everyone else. So there'd always be this like big guy that when it got really scary um, and suddenly the lights all cut out and this character appears very close to you, just lashed out. Um, again, we're dealing with performers who are, there's not a stage, okay? So there's like, you've got to be very careful. So they would go straight for the punch, apparently. Um, and, you know, the rest of their group would be like, cool, we're, we're good. Um, and so then we were like, had to put radios, had to have a minimum distance, had to, you know, kind of temper that, that moment. And so you're trying to optimize the story all the way through for all these different types of people. And also um, we have a, a lecture about bad behavior. And Simon did some research about um, de-individuation. So what happens in a group when you have like a leader of a group, you will tend to um, kind of default to that authority. So you're more likely to be sort of badly behaved or take um, you know people out of the story in this context um, when you have someone you can blame for it. So there's all these kind of dynamics you're, you're managing. Um, and the best way to deal with it is you cannot design for one person. You can't just be the person that makes it up because you're of one type of person. And there are going to be thousands of um, people. Some people are very fearful, but they're also very social. Some people are, you know, so you've got to kind of take the spectrum of people um, into account. Amazing. I'm amazed you didn't have a nervous breakdown and having to <laughs> manage all of that in the one hour, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, and this is true. Festival, but geez, oh. Yeah, <laughs> you know, once it's gone live, it's not over. It's just yeah. the beginning. <laughs> then you're getting many people through and you're constantly changing and adapting the story. And the great thing about this is it isn't a film, right? So you can change it, you can adapt it, you can um, move around it, yeah. Amazing. It sounds fantastic. It really does. But rather than breaking noses, the next question is for you, Simon. Does breaking expectations uh, always enhance the story? That's another one from Robbie. Well, I'm guessing that refers to what I was saying at the beginning of my presentation about what we do. And I think a way of thinking about it is, is like this, that we wander around the world as if everything as if the world we're wandering in is 100% real. And I think from the things that we've said to you this week in the various presentations, and I think probably the rubber hand illusion is, is the one that's really compelling. So in the 1990s, the rubber hand illusion demonstrated that for a human being, reality is when two senses agree, whether or not one of those senses is askew or whether both are askew, it doesn't matter. And, and we can hack that so we can make a new reality for you by changing one of those senses or both of them. Um, and so in a way, audiences, what, what, what we definitely try and do all the time, and that's not only just with the artworks we make, but also with presentations, when you're dealing with something that's relatively new, like virtual reality, there are a lot of expectations of that thing that comes from previous media that are, that can be easily broken. And so it's an interesting way of starting something, um, to, take the reality that that we're living in that we hold to be really certain and absolute and to demonstrate very quickly that it isn't as a way of taking people to a new reality which is in effect the one they're living in rather than a fantastical universe over there and i think that's a very interesting starting point but also if you think about what we're trying to do with the work we make and this use of speculative design with we're we're Mara and I are wandering around the world as two, two human beings who are equally compelled by what we see before us. And then we're spotting things in our regular lives, which sort of become salient because we're looking for them. We're looking for those things. It's a bit like when people learn to lucid dream, they're supposed to wander around there and constantly question whether they're dreaming. And in a way, as an artist, you're wandering around constantly questioning what you're seeing, questioning the ability of everything. And it's surprising well it's not surprising at all i guess to any of us that the uh the, the fractures and the cracks in reality are present all the time and what we're doing in a way is exploiting those to dig deeper into what this world is and what it could be and i guess 
underlying that is the reason why so many stories are about power. Um, uh, because effectively the story of the human race is the story of some people having lots of power, a very small amount, and most people having very little. And, uh, and within that, all of the sort of micro and macro stories that occur out of those scenarios. And so I guess what I'm saying is it's our stock in trade to um, slaughter sacred cows and to break realities as in, in order to sort of raise questions. An excellent end point to an excellent session. And um, I'm afraid, well, I can very, very quickly ask this slightly tangential question, Simon. Is the light day special better than The Last Jedi? <laughs> oh, I've only seen one of those, so I would be, uh, I would be remiss to, um, to uh, just go on what it says on Rotten Tomatoes. Right, very good. Well, in that case, we'll leave that one unanswered. Well, we're just running over time. So thank you very much to um, our participants for all the most excellent questions again. Um, and again, thank you to you guys. You have been absolutely brilliant. You've all done loads of sessions for me. Um, they've been really, really interesting, uh, really insightful, um, loads of really cool stuff to think about. My head's been buzzing for weeks and will be for more weeks because of you guys. So I really do appreciate all your effort and input um thank you so much for for your input to the festival genuinely has been brilliant and i really appreciate it so thank you for that um so uh we're over time um so we've got three sessions left after this one this recording will go up um on northerndigifest.co.uk please share it with your friends because it's really excellent and people need to hear this stuff um so thank you very much for that thank you to sign for helping uh sponsor the event um really appreciate your support without which we couldn't run the festival and tonight we have session 18 which is on digital storytelling with no budget so it's a slightly different format we've got ben um porter and wayne sables who will both be uh, giving us talks on that ben has bootstrapped lots of different businesses uh and is going to be talking about some of his techniques and how he's worked with us pretty much a smartphone and a laptop uh wayne is going to talk to us about how to uh, edit film and do things like that I think he's talking a little bit about DaVinci Resolve um, and so again just showing you some ideas around how to make digital stories with no Muller um, which is often the case and certainly was the case for me for a long time um, and so it's really good to be able to offer uh, something for everybody so hopefully that will be a really good session this evening so try and join us for that if you can uh, and tell your friends uh, you can book your tickets on northerndigifest.co.uk okay I'm going to go now and stop rabbiting thank you very much guys and um, we'll see you again hopefully sometime soon uh, and thanks again take care thank you bye cheers bye bye